Now, I call my talk Fiat Lux. Now, Fiat Lux are very important ledgers because in, in 1454, Johannes Gutenberg printed the first Bible, the first ever printed book. These are the first seven ledgers ever printed. Fiat Lux, let there be light. And this is really where we're going now. I mean, let there be light. Artificial intelligence is going to change the world as we, as we think today. We like, we like to predict the future. We always have. But all of, every time we predict the future, we make mistakes. I mean, we look at things like uh, Lord Kelvin, heavier than air flying machines are impossible. 1896, in 1903, the first plane flew. I think there's a worldwide market for maybe five computers. Thomas Watson, that was not so long ago. <laughs> uh, we don't like their sound and guitar music is on the way out, rejecting the Beatles. Now it's very easy to make predictions, but it's becoming harder and harder. Here's a one last one, 640K of RAM should be enough for anybody, says Mr. Bill Gates. But I want to believe, I want to believe that we are actually going further. Now, some, some of you might be old enough to recognize this slide from X-Files. Today, I don't think that intelligence is enough. Schopenhauer, an Austrian philosopher, once said that intelligence will allow us to hit targets that no one else can hit. But I believe in illumination. I think that illumination is going to allow us to hit targets that no one else can see. And that is really what we're creating today with artificial intelligence. My late father, Dr. Deagle, was part of the team that developed the world's first PC, the Osborne. Some of you might remember this machine, 1981, the first truly portable computer. My father was very proud of this machine. I remember as a kid having to lug them around the house, they weighed about 27 kilos, it was a horrible thing to carry. But my father was very proud of this machine because when they made this machine, they used it to demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was physically impossible for the human body to run 100 meters under 10 seconds. <laughs> to do so, they entered all the physiological data of the human body inside the computer, and they showed it black on white, or sorry, green on black, those little screens, that it was physically impossible. That was in 1981. In May 1983, Carl Lewis ran 100 meters under 10 seconds at low altitude for the first time. And today, if you can't run 100 meters under 10 seconds, stay at home. It's become the standard, because we are constantly breaking barriers, and we are breaking them faster and faster. And big data, artificial intelligence is really accelerating this at an unprecedented rate. I like to say you, can, you can't stop the future. It's happening. Artificial intelligence is here. You can't rewind the past. All we can do today is press play to be part of this adventure, because it is an adventure that we're starting, ladies and gentlemen. There's seven new technologies that are arriving that are completely going to change the face of medical diagnostics, of healthcare, of every, every day, every aspect of our life. One of them is big data, of course, you all know. Other one, artificial intelligence. DNA. DNA is the instruction book for writing life. We've now deciphered DNA. Next step is, now that we've deciphered the alphabet, we start writing new books with this, and we start curing diseases before they even appear. Nanotechnology, in the next 10 years, we'll be injecting arteries with nanorobots that will rotor root your arteries, like vulgar toilets. Hypertension is a thing of the past. In 20, 30 years, it won't exist. 3D printing of body parts. I know in Israel, they're busy printing a heart from stem cells. In, uh, I think it's in Russia, they're doing a pancreas. It's just extraordinary what's happening. Robotics, stem cell therapy. We know that basically, we are busy eradicating disease all over. So imagine the future, no more cancer, no more diseases, no more death. Of course I'm exaggerating, it's a hyperbole. The same ways we'll never run 100 meters under two seconds. Or will we? We don't know yet. But I mean, I still think that we will have death, but there's going to be a bigger and bigger problem. Socioeconomic problems are going to happen. What happens when we have too many people? Marcel Proust, French poet, used to love to say that the real voyage of discovery consists not in looking for new landscapes, but in looking at things with new eyes. And this is truly what we need to do today if we really want to apply artificial intelligence. Come on, that's a beautiful slide. <laughs> All right. Now, look, what I was saying, we know that we're not defeating death. 
but we, what we do know is that statistically, the 150-year-old man is already born. That's statistics. Has anybody had a baby in the last year? If your baby was born in 2017, it's got 32% chance of being a centenarian and 1.66% chance of being 130 years old. 1.66, that's significant. The problem is, it's not really easy to be 150 years old. <laughs> so I couldn't resist, I couldn't resist. You know. The thing is, we are going to have more and more diseases with the old age, and that means management and more and more data. Now, just on average, I think most of you know this, every day, everybody is generating data. On average, an average person out of 7.4 or 7.5 billion people on the planet, every person generates, on average, 500 megs of data a day. <coughs> 500 megs, that's not a lot, or is it? It's huge. Through banking, through cars, through internet, through whatever, you're generating, each and single one of you is generating 500 megs a day. Just to put it in perspective, if you took all the data generated in one day and you printed it on A4 sheets of paper, size 12, font size 12, double-sided, and you stack them up, you'd have a pile of paper that would go all the way to the sun and back four times. That's how much data we're generating every day. Now, we are going to now need to start using data. Today, we're not using data. Today, we're basically doing bean counting. We take the data, we put it in a silo, we regurgitate it in a slightly more palatable format, but the next step is to really start using data, and that's what artificial intelligence is going to help us to do. But in many ways, all of us, we have a problem in data today, and that problem is called the ghost of data safety. We will be defined, us, you, me, we will be defined as a generation that's given up its right to privacy. This is the first opening phrase of Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. Mm. You are my creator, but I am your master. In many ways, we have become the slayers of data. I use this as a stupid example, because most people are actually are scared of, of data. We all know that Google is stupid. That's, sorry, it's not actually stupid, but that's the perception. We, most people think of Google as some evil little man who's busy rubbing his hands, busy watching you and thinking, ooh, look at Alina, I'm gonna sell her tons and tons of stuff. Most people think of Google as a negative thing. And it's easy to make stupid examples of Google. For instance, what happens if you type in pictures of animals but no cows? What do you think you're gonna get? You get pictures of cows. <laughs> because Google is not doing a semantic analysis of what you're looking for, they're just taking the most powerful word. But you mustn't think that Google, that technology that is today still limited, will remain limited. Today, if you just replace but no with a symbol minus, ah, then you don't have any more cows. Because minus is something that the computer understands. That's just, again, binary data processing. It's relatively simple, relatively obvious. This is the world's first real computer, IBM 1967. NASA used two of these computers to send a man on the moon. The first Cray supercomputer arrived in 1974. Today, an iPhone 6 is a thousand times more powerful than a Cray supercomputer of 1974. So you can just imagine what's going to now happen because everybody has an iPhone. I mean, nearly everybody has that. Today, you have 7.5 billion people with the processing power of a thousand Cray Cube computers in their hand. Imagine what that's going to do in terms of medical research, in terms of speeding up development. We are right now at the elbow of a complete revolution in technology that's going to happen in the three or, the three or four next years. We now know, and it's accepted since about 2015, I mean, 10 years ago when I was talking about connectivity, everybody thought we were crazy. Connectivity is just for young, trendy geeks. But nowadays, everybody, everything is connected. We know that every day we're generating tons and tons of data, and it's, we, but we're right now not using these data. We're putting them in separate silos, healthcare, banking, insurance, investments. Right now, I'm doing, sorry, if eventually I could get a glass of water, is that possible? Uh, thanks very much, Sean. Sorry, I tend to speak too fast. Um, we're generating these tons and tons of uh, silos. Right now, I'm working for a Swiss project called Health Bank, 
where we try to actually assemble all of these projects to actually have one single set of data from healthcare, insurance, etc., etc., that we're actually convincing people to donate their data. Today, I only have 267,000 users. I aim to have 2 million users before the end, the end of next year. Because when I have 2 million users, then I can really start playing with data instead of just regurgitating it. So I think that big data is going to completely change in the sense that it's going to allow us to accelerate. We have a regulatory problem right now in Europe because regulatory, by definition, is always going to be late from innovation. So today, we are trying to push beyond regulatory, but the regulatory is, thank you very much, the regulatory is today a massive hurdle for all developing companies, especially in Europe, because you have 26 different countries with 26 different sets of regulations, whereas in the US, you have one country with about 350 million people, so it's a lot easier. The biggest problem, most people are using the fear of data as an excuse for not doing what they should be doing today. I'd like to do an interesting test. Everybody here has a smartphone, right? Could you all take out your smartphones? It's just an interesting test. So everybody, take it out of your pocket, switch it on, unlock it. Now do me a favor and pass it to the person to your left for five minutes. Unlocked. <laughs> That just feels weird, you know, it's just not right. But again, none of you have got private things on your phones. It's just, you don't like sharing your intimate. It's become part of your way of life. You don't want to. And so people have got this fear of data, of how we're going to use the data. And we tend to have this semantic problem in Europe specifically, where we ask negative questions. If I ask Aileen, I mean, are you scared that I'm going to take your medical data and send it to the insurance companies to make you pay more money? Then you say, of course you're scared. But if I ask you, Adin, would you accept to share your anonymous blood pressure data with the Heart Foundation to do epidemiological research? In fact, the reality is that never once in my 25 years of medical career have I met a patient who was not prepared to share his data. The only people who are concerned about data safety are people who are not concerned. The people who really want to develop new technologies and really make the world a better place and find solutions for this are always happy to share their data. So the biggest message that we have today is that you have to get rid of this fear of data. In, I think that in four or five years, getting your data will be about the same thing as doing an organ donation. Most people are for organ donations. It's not seen as a negative thing. It's not everybody does it, but it's certainly a positive gesture more than a negative one. And this is really what is definitely going to happen with medical health. Today we are polluted by all these Cambridge Analytics scandals and Facebook, and the, but this is a fake problem. The fact is that medical data only has value if it is used. So what's your name? Charles. Charles, can I ask you just, without thinking, you just tell me the first thing that goes through your head. How much is your medical data worth? You, as an individual, give me a number. Um, 2,000 euros. How about you? 5,000. In reality, I'm very sorry to disappoint you, Charles, and I'm sorry, I don't know what your name is. Xavier. Xavier. Bonjour, Xavier. Bonjour. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but your data is actually only worth $1.67, as estimated by Harvard University. That is the true value of the data of one individual, because data only has value if it is used. But however, if I take all the data from all the people in this room, and I put it all together, it's worth how many people in this room? 150, 200? It's worth a heck of a lot more than 200 times $1.67. Times $1. Again, data has value if it is used for epidemiological purposes. I can use your data to save a life. That is truly the value of data. But today, everybody is busy shaking the ghosts of data safety that we really need to get rid of. So today, our dream is starting. I beg your pardon? Cambridge Yes, of course. Of course, because it's a new technology and abuses will always happen when there's new technology. It does happen. But it is the fear of what might happen is not a reason for not doing what you should do. It behooves us. It is our responsibility to actually do medical research and make the, the world a better place. It will happen. Right now, of course, I do understand that there are problems, Cambridge Analytics and Facebook, and I mentioned them, 
and this perception that people are all out there to steal your data, but most people want to, most of you here have got laudable projects. You're doing medical research, you're trying to find cures for cancer. That is where the data becomes useful. So we mustn't just let the ghost of data safety actually pollute what we really believe, because the real future is to use the data, and I can guarantee you that in maybe 10, 15 years, certain data, like genomics data, will be an obligatory thing. Why? I mean, everybody, your, gen your gen genome will be deciphered at birth so that we can prevent data. Because if we have, the more information we have, we'll be able to not just offer healthcare for everyone, but offer healthcare for each and every single one of us. That we'll be able to make tailor made decisions for you, Charles, for you, Xavier, for every single person will be able, but to be able to give these solutions, I really need to have access to your data. So, of course, there are bumps in the road, but the, the main message is don't get discouraged about using your data the right way. We know that the dream is nearly there. I think it's already changed today from what it was three, four, five years ago. People are starting to accept that the data can be useful. But dreams are particularly fragile. Today we are suffering, and this is in answer to the Cambridge Analytics and Facebook account, we are facing with what we call river luxury. We know that all the technology is there. We, the tools are there. We know that we have the data, we're starting to get data, but because of semantic problems, because of perception problems, people are still scared of using their data in the right way. I'm not saying use your data indiscriminately, but I'm saying use it in the correct way. Because we are not just designing the man of tomorrow, we are designing the society of tomorrow. If I could predict the future today, I would not actually be making medical devices. You can well imagine that. I'd be making money. But the only thing today we know about the future is that it's going to be completely different from what we expect. Ladies and gentlemen, the future is calling, and I hope that you will be part of that future. Thank you very much. Thank you.